Hello, writers. I speak to you today of tents. Also, I spoke to you at some time in the past of tents and recorded it. Over the course of this video, I will speak to you of tents. The conversation starts with some simple grammar that I'll blast through pretty quickly. You probably learned it a long time ago in grade school, filled out a worksheet, took a quiz, never thought about it again. You also internalized most of this without trying to when you learned to talk and to understand language. So when you learned about it in grade school, it seemed unimportant. It seemed like something you already knew. Grammar stuff will fly by fast, no need to memorize, no quizzes, just information to refresh memory and focus your attention on this particular aspect of language as we use it. Then you'll see how each of the tenses serves you as a writer. Some rules of the road for authors, screenwriters, and playwrights regarding tense. With all of that floating about in your wonderful absorbent mind, I will reveal to you the way that you can utilize an awareness of tense to change the way you think, remove regret, remorse, and long-standing blocks to regain the aspirational, forever-inspired child mind. Let's do this in order. Past perfect, the very pastest you can get, thus perfect, tells the reader or listener that the events described happened before the time in which the surrounding story takes place. When something had happened already, information will be backfilled in some way from an earlier time. Past tense, the tense in which almost all prose has been written over the years and remains by far the most used tense for prose, tells a reader that you speak of things that happened in the past. When the action of a sentence takes place as the writer puts it to the page, or in the moment the reader imagines it, we use the present tense. The thing happens right now, in the present. When we write or speak about things yet to happen, I'm going to, one day we will, we speak in the future tense. The future. I know this sounds simple. Stick with me. Weirdly, the future perfect tense does not move the action into some greater future, but rather moves the writer and the reader into some farther ahead time from which an action that has not yet occurred may be observed in the past. The tenses past perfect, past, present, future, and future perfect tell the reader where the information exists relative to them in time. Most literature is written in the past tense, whether the story delivered comes in the first person as when it is delivered by a hard-boiled detective or by an omniscient narrator who observes and reports. Even science fiction taking place in the far future uses this form, informing us in other ways of our time frame so that we as readers may enjoy a story in the customary fashion. To trust that a story will find a resolution, we must trust that the writer knows where it's going. This confidence comes effortlessly to a reader primed to believe by the authoritative voice that speaks of that which has already indisputably occurred. Some journalism and most textbooks, those not dealing with history but with science or math, come to us in the present tense. Scripts also deliver their action in the present tense. While the writer delivers a map of what will happen when the production is put together, he or she, or they, must deliver the information in the order in which the audience will experience it in real time. The future tense shows up frequently in inspirational and aspirational works, self-help books, and works of proper futurism. Many people have difficulty writing anything in the future tense. It feels as though 
Commitment to a future tense sentence of any kind runs the risk of becoming a lie should the prediction fail to come true. The greatest conmen, the most successful salesmen, the greatest leaders, and the worst, speak confidently of what they will do. Whether you will rally loyal forces, gather votes, convince a stranger that those shoes will change his life, or involve a mark in a non-existent plot that will put two million in your hands if you can just get five thousand together to get the locked trunk out of the storage unit on which you owe some back rent, speaking of the future becomes a promise made to be kept or abandoned. The promise made with no intention of keeping it becomes a crime because we understand at some base level that the words we use, the things we say, have power and that to misuse this power represents a breach of decency, a misuse of the basic technology of language. Let me offer a small parenthetical bit of druidry instead of going down the rabbit hole of language as early technology and advanced magic. Long ago, very few knew how to read and write. Well before Gutenberg invented the movable type printing press, before the Romans invaded Gaul and Brittany, before the Chinese first invented movable type printing, before the Norsemen came south, Druids lived in the forests of the lands that now make up England and France. Common mythology holds that they were secretive and never wrote anything down, but in fact their forms of recording communication, like their homes, were largely biodegradable. Not all learned to read and write in the autumn lettering, though. Most memorized in an oral tradition, using rhyme and tune to make important tales and history more easily retainable. Imagine this. Rather than the rote prayers that came with Roman Catholicism later laid down in ink by scribes to be repeated by worshippers, the Druids taught children a three-part poem to recite each evening and to revise each night as they went through it line by line. This simple prayer to the self would become a habitual internal ritual as they went to sleep. They would compose a poem of self-awareness in three simple stanzas of decreasing length. The longest was a list of things they had been and done, the second shorter catalogs, things they are now. The final stanza, a single line, will state an aspiration, metaphoric or literal. Thus, as they matured, they took stock daily of their continuing experience and recommitted themselves to a single current aspiration. The nightly ritual predating modern concepts of neuro-linguistic programming by centuries, millennia perhaps. The repeated effort of recreating, revising each night would train the brain into an assumption of perpetual growth and psychological self-correction. Moreover, it would habituate each practitioner to the idea of prioritizing aspirations to better choose one's path. The stories we tell ourselves can be used to focus our intention. Become aware of your use of tense in your writing and in speaking. Particularly when speaking in the future tense, the more strongly you feel about a thought, the more important it will become to release your prevarications, your it-seems-to-me's, and your maybe-if-things-work-out-we-could's. They'll hang on. It'll take effort. But once you make the shift from, I'm hoping to get down to San Diego some weekend to see the seals, to I'm going to San Diego to see the seals, your brain will begin to work out the details to help you keep that promise. The resistance to saying aloud the thing we will do lies in deeply resonant dissonance, a grating discomfort with speaking an untruth. We know that language, the very first element of a budding civilization, depends on an agreed-upon understanding of words and their meanings. To create falsehoods, to use words deceptively, for those with a properly developed conscience, feels wrong. 
Once we realize that this sensation represents our own brain's connection to ancient intuition of magic's linguistic, it allows us to both speak more clearly our intentions and save those intentions for the moments when we know we can speak them clearly without concern that we will not fulfill them. When we begin to know what tense we write in, we can become aware of the tense in which our inner monologue functions. Most people in modern America think perpetually in the past tense. We turn to old grievances in our minds, we review our successes, our failures, we indulge in nostalgic distortion, we pine and we languish. The great spiritual masters speak of being in the present. Truly great leaders tend to think and speak in the future tense, looking toward the next thing, leaving behind the great successes and the wreckage of failures as they plan and execute their new ambitions. To truly take command of your own destiny when you find yourself re-examining the past, Unless you do so deliberately toward your work as a writer or in therapy for your work as a human, shift your focus to the present by taking in that which is around you and recentering on the sound of your breath. Then shift forward farther, thinking in the future tense. Make plans in your mind in full sentences. Start small. Plan to get laundry done and then follow through. Or to pick up a gift for someone you did. Plan big. Fantasize futures as you did in childhood when all things were possible. When you find a thing you can do to make your life or the world a little bit more like the ideal one you dream, speak aloud the clear intention. The tense in which we think affects our behavior and our ability to create and advance our own agendas. It affects our ability to release things from the past that do not serve us in the present. Once you take control of your tense, the grip of stasis will relax. Thank you for watching, or at this point, for having watched this recording. I'm Dylan Brody. Active Voice Production supports, nurtures, and guides writers at all stages of their careers. Wherever you find yourself on your writer's path, look us up at activevoiceproductions.com slash for writers.